watching over on YouTube. Um, we got the mic back up. So this is filmed live in front of a studio audience of one here in the studio and all of you wherever you are on the internet. So tonight we're going to talk about warping. I'm going to talk about warping at multiple stages because it can happen at so many places along the making process. So we'll talk about, and this is really for hand building mostly. So hi everyone, welcome, come on in. So here's some hand built platters and trays that I have here. And um, this right here, so you have issues with your mug toppers warping. We can talk about that. So warping happens in the making, it happens in the drying, it happens in the firing. So those are the three ty like times it's gonna warp, right? And um, it's the Great Pottery Throwdown Final. I have watched only one episode of this season, so don't tell me, I have no idea what's going on. I'm gonna catch up, I'm gonna binge it all at once. I just haven't had a chance to. So, shh, don't tell me, don't tell me what's going on. So we're gonna talk about warping and I'm gonna be using some GR Pottery forms to make some pieces. And as I'm making them, I'm gonna talk to you about what can cause them to warp and what I do to prevent that. And then we have some other news, some sad, some good. And I'll talk about the different clays because uh, the clay you're using, some clays are more prone to warping than others. So that's something to think about. So back to the news. Um, many of you have already seen that the Inseca conference has been canceled. And that was pretty sad. I go every year. It's a clay conference in the world. I think this year they were gonna hit record numbers of almost 8,000 people which would have been fabulous, but because of everything going on right now with um, everybody's health and the coronavirus, they decided to, to cancel it for this year, but they'll have it next year. So I was thinking about it, and I know I had a very full schedule planned. I was gonna be demonstrating all kinds of building, like similar to what I'm doing tonight. I was gonna be doing Scraffito, Mishima, watercolor pottery, talking about glazing, and we were gonna have our clay share meetup and magnet exchange. And I was feeling kind of down about it, and I know a lot of you have been feeling down as well. And so I thought, I gotta do something. We, we have that week anyways. We took the week off, right? Or we planned to travel that week. So um, I decided that, you know what? I'm gonna do my own version. So we're gonna have Clay Share Con, which is Clay Share's online clay conference. And that is gonna happen coming up in just 10 days. So it's gonna be Saturday, March 21st through Wednesday, March 25th. And I am gonna come live to you every day at noon Eastern time. You can watch it on clayshare.com. You can watch it right here on the ClayShare Facebook page, and you can watch it on my YouTube channel, which is my name, Jessica Putnam Phillips. And if you're not following me yet on YouTube, go find me there. I have like, I don't know how many videos there. A lot of them are very informal, and it's more just hanging out with me in the studio. Not, not like my ClayShare classes, which are very structured, very formal teaching. So it's two different halves, right? So that's gonna happen, and I'll be doing some Let's think about it. Hand building, right? We'll do scraffito, carving through underglaze. We can talk about using slip versus using underglaze. Uh, I'm gonna be doing carving, modern Mishima with wax. So I'll be doing a Mishima inlay technique. And then I'll be doing watercolor pottery. Um, let's see, what else? I don't have the list in front of me, so it's just coming out of my head. I'll be doing the wheel throwing demo. So I'll throw some pots and I might mix it up and do some double walled things and we'll have a good time with that. And then we are going to have a special guest. Drew Seymour is going to come out from Clayscapes Pottery and be here in my studio. And he's going to do a couple broadcasts, some with me and maybe on his own. We're going to talk about glazing. Uh, we're going to talk about kiln, firing your kiln and maintaining your kiln. Plus every day I'm going to have a Q&A session so we can talk about the thing I just did or whatever questions you have and we can just chat and hang out. And all of this is gonna be free. It's gonna be noon Eastern time. It's on clayshare.com. If you go look right now, you'll see all the infos up there. We are also gonna have sponsors. So we do have GR Pottery Forms that's on board. Clayscapes is on board. Garrity Tools is coming on board. Sam Bow Studios is gonna be on board. Um, and the others are coming in I'm, we're, since we just started this and got this together and I've been contacting everyone. So they're all coming on board. And the plan is this, 
I'm going to show you the products they would have brought to Inseca and the things that you would have seen in person at Inseca and also the discounts that they would have had for the Inseca conference. I'm hoping that they will pass along and let me share with you so you can get those discounts during that period of time or however long they want to. So this is a way we can do a virtual conference. So it's Clay Share Con is what we're calling it. This is the first time we're doing it. If you love it, we'll do it, but we'll move it so it doesn't happen when, um, oh, Gary just made a new batch of dinos. So maybe I can talk to him about getting a dino for me in the studio, because every studio needs a dinosaur. And the way it's gonna be is the only way we can film it is it has to have to be here. So if anybody's gonna be live and be part of it, they have to be here in the studio. We don't really have a way for me to broadcast uh, all my camera gear is here, all my lighting gear is here, and it's a very sophisticated setup. So if they want to come to my studio, then yeah, they can film. So we'll see. So far, we've got um, the big time. I don't know about that. So far, I'll be doing a bunch of demos, and Drew is coming to do glazing demos. So, and this is the thing. If this is something you all want to see, you only ran 100 so, well, I missed that, Sharon. <laughs> so, if you like this and you want this to happen every year, we could see about adding other instructors to come and be a part of it, right? So, it'll be noon Eastern every day for five days straight, hour and a half, two hours. We'll see how it goes. And the replays will be available. This is all free. And the replays will be available after if you miss the live broadcast. Okay, so a couple other awesome things happened this week in Clayshare land. Um, Amico and Mako's new glazes. Yeah, so Joe, I have emailed Amico. We will see what happens with Amico. I messaged Mako. I've heard nothing yet from Mako, but I will email Mako separately. So I messaged and emailed them through different channels. So I'll reach back out to Mako. I would love them to come on board. Georgie's and I'm chatting. So we'll see. I'm sure Georgie's will be on board. Yeah, Rich, I think so. Uh, Georgie's and I have a very good relationship. I love them. So it starts March 21st, Saturday at noon. So Saturday at noon, Sunday at noon, Monday at noon, Tuesday at noon, Wednesday at noon. Five days in a row, starting at noon every day to about two o'clock, I'll be doing a live broadcast and we'll be making. It won't be so much chatter. Not as much chatter is happening right now. It'll be making pots. And uh, Drew's gonna come out for Tuesday and Wednesday. So we'll see what happens when he comes. And I'm getting everything really tightened up as far as the schedule goes. Still talking about Clay Share, Clay Topia, Clay Copia. You changed the name, it's cute. Laguna Tammy, um, I messaged them. I won't say no, but I doubt Laguna will come on board. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I Laguna proved me wrong, come on board, right? We'll see. Everybody I've talked to is like Laguna won't be interested. So we'll see. Wait till 500 people show up at my studio. <laughs> I know, right, Rich? That would be the thing. Um, so we have the, the new Garden Bell class just went up. That's a hand building class. I've got a class coming up this week, a little more informal than, than I usually do. It has an unboxing, which was super exciting. Kind of spoiling it by telling you, but it had mushrooms and twist pin designs are in that class and we make a plate we make a plate and it's it's a hand building class but next week's class is a wheel throwing class yay us and then the week after there'll be no class there's no class the week after i'm not doing it no the reason is because I'll be doing Clay Share Con, so we're gonna have five days of classes, two hours each day. So there's like in one week. So the week of, there'll be a new class on the 13th, a new class on the 20th, but starting the 21st, there won't be a new class until the third because we're gonna have a whole week of lives, a whole week of it. So it's awesome. I think so. Yeah, the garden bell class was fabulous. Yay! And no buffering is a winner, right? You love the garden bell, you're gonna make a few. And make all different sizes because they're so cute. Oh, I didn't get to reset the cardboard either. There's still a 
<laughs> All right, so I want to show you a couple things and we'll talk about warping. Now, I find that warping can, happens a lot with slab built pottery like this. And it can happen with wheel throwing, but usually it doesn't. Usually it's the hand built pottery and really it's slab built. Coils do warp some, but it's the slab. So let's talk about the physics of what's going on, right? Let's, we roll out a slab of clay like I have here, right? So you're working from a flat sheet. So what has happened um, is we took our block of clay and we've shaped it into a sheet of clay. So it wants to be a sheet now. We've changed its, we've changed its properties to make it flat. You're new to all clay stuff. Well, welcome because I love to share everything I do and you can come join us. And if you're new, you will learn something. So what am I going to, when am I going to make the garden bell? The garden bell is up, Nini. It's up. The garden bell class is on clayshare.com, tv.clayshare. Go watch it. It's there. It's up. Garden bell is done. Right. Compress, compress, slow dry, and weigh the slab. Corey taught it. We're done. <laughs> so Rich, Richard was asking about the mushrooms. Yes. My, you know, my mushroom decals. Well, I did a mushroom rolling pin and I also did a cute bunny. Hopping bunnies, sitting bunnies, standing bunnies, baby bunnies, ladybugs, mushrooms are in there too, snails, butterflies, all the cuties, all the cuties are here. So for Lanice, she said it's all herky jerky, but everybody else is crystal clear, hun. So I think it might be your connection, but you know, such as Facebook, I'm sort of stuck with it. <laughs> I love you too, Corey. You know that. So. Um, let's, let's make, let's make and talk, right? So I'm going to pull you all in close so that you're just looking at me working and we'll talk about things as I'm making. And if you have questions, please ask them as I'm doing this and we'll find out, right? We'll find out. So there's lots of stuff going on when we hand build. Let's get you in here, everybody. Sorry, you just have to bear with me while I adjust everything. There we go. All right, so I have a sheet of clay I've rolled out on my slab roller right here. And this, I would guess, I'm going to guess, but I have it set for, I think I have it at three eighths of an inch, which is thicker than a quarter of an inch. You know, it's a, it's a nice thick slab. And the reason I rolled them out this thick is because we're going to smooth this out and compress it. So we're going to thin it down when we do that. But also I want to roll texture into it and you need to have a soft slab and enough material to press in to get a good impression. So I get a lot of comments from people. They are trying to use a rolling pin that has texture in it and they're not getting a good impression. So my question always is to them to find out what they're doing is, is your clay soft enough? Because if your clay is stiff or hard, it has to be really soft to get your impression in there. Also, you want to make sure it's thick enough. You have to have material to press into. It won't work if you don't have enough clay to actually get your texture in, right? It's difficult to find a ceramist that keep, does not keep secrets. Well, we, everybody has secrets, you know, I mean, I guess that's life, but I try to share pretty much everything that I can, you know, so I've just compressed and smoothed out one side and I'm going to do the other. And then the, the other thing about getting a good impression with your texture is you want to make sure when you're rolling your rolling pin into your clay that you're not trying to roll out away from you. You're actually rolling down into the clay because you've got to get that impression in, right? So that's, that's what you've got to do. The sound is not better on Facebook than on YouTube. So, hmm, I can speak a bit louder. Let me check. Mic's on. We're good. Um, YouTube is getting that mic. Facebook's YouTube's getting, getting that. Mic. Facebook's getting from the camera. So uh, I'll project a little more and maybe that'll help you all out a bit and see if you can turn your volume up and then that way you can hear me. I have found since I started wearing the mic, if I project my voice too much, it's a little too intense for everybody. And I, I don't want to do that, right? It's much better on Facebook than on YouTube. Interesting, because YouTube's using the my Rode mic. So now I've done this, and I want to add texture to it. You don't have to add texture to your pieces, but if you want to, the best time to do it is while your slab is soft. 
And the thing is, is you can go ahead and you can roll your texture into your soft clay and then let your slab sit up till it's stiff enough to work with. So if you're worried that your clay is too floppy, that's okay because you can let it sit afterwards. I'm going to use the bunnies. I can't help it. The bunnies are crazy cute. They're my, my new love. They basically have everything you could ever want in a rolling pin in them. So I'm going to go with that. And I'm also going to stand on my stool back here because I'm a petite gal. I'm only 5'2". So I really want to get up above my texture that I'm going to be rolling in. And I just want to tell you that this pin rolls endlessly. Someone asked, can we get Primetime Live on Roku? We cannot do that on Roku. No, no, that's not a possibility. Roku um, doesn't, uh, doesn't, that doesn't work for us. Maybe someday. I don't even know if Roku does lives. Um, Kevin's going to think about it for a minute. I'm going to roll this in, in the clay. Anything that we pushed into uh, TV Dot would go into all of the apps live. I'm going to do a couple strips because, ooh, scoot this way. All right, excuse my wibbly wobbly right there when I did that. So here we have bunnies, rows and rows and rows of bunnies. It's super compressed sounding on YouTube. Interesting. So I'll ask Kevin to see if he can figure that out for me and why it's all compressed on YouTube. All right, so I've rolled my texture in. Whether you put texture in or not, that's really not an issue for warping. That's just whether you want it to be there for a decorative purpose, right? Now, if you let this set up a little bit, your texture is gonna stay more prominent. If you work with this right away while it's really soft, what can happen is you can actually crush your texture. And it does happen. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna work with a smaller piece, just because if I try to do a great big platter right now, I will potentially crush my texture. I don't wanna do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab one of these DR Pottery forms. This is one of their platforms. I've got a little blue something on there. Let me scrub it off. So you have good sound on your phone. Good to know. I was asking for the stabilization on the bunnies one. So okay. I, I just adjusted the level a little bit so it didn't sound quite so compressed as it was. Hmm. But I am going to do that. I'm like, we'll do the platform. And then I'm like, no, I want to do a tray. I want to do a big tray. Let's do a big tray. It's the Easter tray. We want a big tray. So I have, you cast it on your TV so you can turn me way up. Awesome. So this is a set from DR Pottery. It's their rounded rectangle set and there's three. And we do have a discount on this. Is it Clayshare 10, I think? The discount, but go to clayshare.com and you can find out the discount for DR Pottery forms. But that discount's only good if you order directly through them. So what I like to do is I use the bigger of them right here. I use the biggest one as my template. And then I'm going to flip it over onto the middle side. So use one size up as your template. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to cut this out. I'm just looking at my bunnies because I'm trying to decide who I want in the center. I want um, this right here. Right there. That may sound bad, but I'm trying to fix it. Uh-oh, Kevin messed up the sound by trying to fix it. Ke Kevin, the sound was fine. Did you uh, do that? Or did you move? Did I move? Your mic or something? Because now I'm, I don't know <laughs> if you got any sound. We've got no sound. I will start signing, and that's, that's how we're going to hear the broadcast. I'm getting my mic checked, everybody. This is what happens when you're all high tech and you, your mic goes out. Okay, so mic's good. So you see how I use that to create my template? So I have this really nice, perfectly rounded, ended little oval rectangle, right? My the rounded rectangle. Let me grab another one. So that's going to make my rim, and this will be the inside. See how we have a nice rim now? Ta-da! It's like magic. All right. So the rest of this clay I still want. It's very nice, it's very soft. We're gonna use it for other things. So I'm gonna grab a board over here. And I'm actually gonna pull my round rectangle off onto that board, onto all those platters. 
your phone kept freezing up. up like this. So we have basically a sheet of clay, right? We have a flat sheet of clay. And that sheet of clay is going to want to stay flat. But we're going to introduce some force onto this to change it because we do not want it to stay flat. We want it to shape to fit this right here, right? So we want to conform it so it fits with this. So we have to apply pressure to it to change its shape. And up, making sure it's fairly even. It's, it doesn't have to be perfect. This, this is not rocket science. This is making a bunny tray. This is Easter tray time. So we're just going to flip the whole thing over and watch. <laughs> we're going to use the same board. So we flip it over, and then I'm going to sit this back down just like that. So you can see the clay is starting to slump. So these are often called drape molds, hump molds, right? And you can make your own. This happens to be from GR Pottery Forms. And they're really great. And they're called that because you drape it over. And they're called hump molds because it's like a hump shape, right? It's like a lump. This is the medium rounded rectangle. Yes, it is. And I have the set of three because you can use the larger ones to make the template for the next size down. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm just very lightly using my red rib and I'm going to compress this on the bottom, but I'm not trying to crush it. I don't want to destroy my texture. I just want to smooth this on. And this clay is honestly a little soft. And then on the sides, I'm just going to run the rib gently along the sides. And you'll see, see how the clay is folding down over this edge. And I'm going to actually use the curve side. And I messaged Cheryl Mud Tools about coming on board as a sponsor too. So we're working on that. Working on that. We, we have to be kind to Kevin. Kevin injured himself Sunday and basically gave himself a concussion. And he hasn't been working much. I say much because, you know, getting him to stop is impossible. So I'm just going to keep bringing this down the sides until I make my, my rim right here. See, I'm just bringing this around. And what will happen is the clay, I'll keep bringing it down until it touches the board. And when it touches the board, I'm gonna stop compressing. What do I use for a template for a larger size platter form? That's such a good question. So I make my own, and I have a class on making your own templates. But basically, I take this form here, I sit it down on a piece of craft foam, and I make it one inch bigger all the way around. So you're just going to take this, put it on craft foam, and then trace this shape, but one inch bigger. And that will give you a fabulous template to use. And you can do that with any size, anything. I like to go an inch bigger. It gives you a nice rim. Your other option is if you don't want a template, you can make it. And I, I do show in my sprig tray with handles class. That's this actual tray right here. Let me grab it. I want to show you the difference between the two. This one doesn't have a rim so much. It does have a side and it comes up and it kind of stops at the top. This one comes up and it has a nice rim. You can see it sticking out. You see? So this is actually the largest size. This is the medium, but it's almost as big as the large because I use the large as the template. So although they're two different sized bottoms, that really shows it. There's the bottoms. See this bottom's bigger than this is a smaller bottom. So what we're doing tonight right now is basically this right here. We're making this shape. The mud rib that I'm using right now is their red and it is their number one. It's the number one red rib. It's a fabulous rib. So we smooth this out and you can add a foot. You don't have to. I'm going to add a foot because that's kind of how I roll. So I'm going to grab my clay that I have over here. So this is just the clay that I rolled out when I made my template for it. I'm just going to flip it over. Oh, bye bunnies. OK, 
how cute. Oh, no. It's pretty sad. I might cry. They're so cute. Oh my goodness, they're so cute. So we're going to make a quick little foot for this. And I find the little foot maker is the best way. Hi, John. <laughs> Hello to you too. So this is a foot maker. It's basically a corn cob holder that I filed down the edges and spread open a bit. And I do have a tutorial on Clay Share and on YouTube. Those of you on YouTube, you can go, you can make a foot maker of your own. Make your very own. You don't have to buy these, although you can, they do sell them. And if you watch me make it, you get to watch me use power tools, which is terrifying. Completely terrifying. <laughs> So what we've done is we've taken a flat sheet of clay and we've conformed it to this mold. And it doesn't matter what mold you use. It was a sheet, but by compressing it and smoothing it out like we did, it's now become the shape we want it to be, right? So it will stay this shape pretty much on its own unless other forces are acted upon it, which is what comes into play. So we're gonna go ahead and after we make it, it needs to dry. And I will dry this overnight on the, on the form it's on right now. So let's go ahead and finish some attaching the foot. Talking about drying before I've even, before I've even got the foot on. Adding a foot helps prevent warping. Uh, the foot maker was on your shopping list. Now, Jennifer, you're going to have to make one, honey. You got to make one. There's just no way out. You can't get out of it. Now you got to do it. Got to make it. You got to make it. You now you have to go watch my class and make it. There's no other option. You're stuck. That's it. You got homework. <laughs> They're really easy to make. Uh, I can make them. You can make them, right? So adding a foot does help prevent warping somewhat. Although I weigh my my pieces down, and we're going to get to that part in just a second. By weighing it down. You know, we're, we're using other forces to enact upon it, right? You made two of the platters this week, but you're still struggling with something to use to uh, make the handles. So do you want to make a handle, like you want to make a sprig molded handle like I did in my class? Is that what it is? Because you could just pull, you could just pull some handles and attach them to it. Some really nice, simple pulled handles. All right, so I had to cut two one strip that was long enough and there's a little overlap and sometimes when you have that overlap you get a little depression and so I'll just fill it in with a little ball of clay and we'll smooth all of it out and you won't even see it when it's all said and done so we'll just blend that in and you won't even know there was a join there so if you find you're joining your two parts where they butt up against each other and that's actually called a butt join that's the truth. It's called a butt join. And what can happen is there's not enough material there and it can pull apart. So if you find you have a little depression in there, go ahead and just take a tiny ball of clay and roll it up. And you see, you saw how I laid it on there. So now we're going to compress this foot and just really get it on here. So I'm going to use my sponge to do that. Just smoothing it out. Now for this one, I... Someone just asked if you... Slip and score that foot. I did. I slipped and scored it. I totally did. I'm sorry. I don't think I said I was doing it, but I did. I slipped and scored the base and I slip and scored the strip. So both pieces are slipped and scored and then attached. But yes, I always slip and score when I join. Um, it's an interesting thing. Some potters don't slip and score. And I, I'm not sure if they're using magic or what to get their pieces to stick because I have not found that to work. At all. So let's compress the sides. So we're just sealing this up and I'm going to use the side of my finger. So you don't have to get fancy if you don't want to. Now one of my favorite tools for sealing up joins is this color shaper right here. It's also a now being marketed as a clay shaper. For many years these were just for making um, pastel painting and oil painting, but now the clay world is using them and they're calling them color clay shapers, although they're charging a lot more money. So <laughs> if you go online on Amazon, 
I think I put them in the Amazon shop for Clayshare. If you go there, you can find them and they're very affordable. If you go through your clay supplier, they might have a deal, but I was looking at some and they were kind of pricey, like $12 for one. They should be like $8 for a pack. You should not pay $12 for one. Don't do that. Save money for buying clay and glaze. They call them color shapers in the clay world, yeah. So they do call them color shapers, but now I'm seeing them as clay shapers. Although I learned them as color shapers because I have a, um, you know, I was painting for a few years before I did clay, you know. So, all right, we have the foot all smoothed out. So we need to let this sit overnight and then we are going to flip it off the form. We're going to leave it. So this is B Mix, Laguna B Mix with no grog. Yes, that's the clay I'm using. And I have another one which I will grab. Let me buy the magic of television. Sorry, I have to walk across the studio to get it. But I'll be back with it. Hold on. It's coming. Makes you think my studio is huge. I have to walk all the way over there to get it. All right, so here I have this and we're going to put it on this shelf. So we're going to sit this off to the side. This will dry overnight with plastic on top of it. Just drape a sheet of plastic and let it set and then tomorrow I'll flip it off. So that's the first step, right? Just let it just let it sit overnight. Don't rush it to take it out of the form. If you rush, then what's going to happen is it's going to collapse or you're going to have some slumping on your plate and you don't want that. So you're going to let that sit. Put that over there. And here's one I made. Now, I made this a couple days ago, so it's already out of the form. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this. Kevin's not Vanna. Not, I know, right? Tonight, I don't have a Vanna, Kevin. He's not feeling well, and I honestly can't ask too much of him. So we're going to pretend this was drying. <laughs> what size is my clay shaper? That's a funny question because all different companies have different sizes. It's the one that I have on the Amazon shop. So if you go to amazon.com slash shop slash clay share, you'll see it's this one. Um, we could measure millimeters, I guess. That might be the best measurement. Let me see. Oh, I took my ruler to my wheel. I was throwing with it. So it dries overnight. Isn't it too dry to put handles on it? So Kathleen, you're going to make sure you cover it really well, right? Because you want it to be, um, you wait 30 minutes to flip. What can happen is with a tray form, so we're talking about tray forms, not plates. Plates, I would go a little less time, but plates, what you can flip them out in usually two, three hours. This is a half an inch long. Is that, does that help? <laughs> it's, it's half an inch long, so that's what I've got. We'll see if we can get a better dimension for you. Mm -hmm. uh, a question from mm -hmm. YouTube on how do you uh, level or flatten the foot so that it Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't show. I didn't show. Sorry, guys. All right. So what I do is when I make my plate like I or tray like I just did, I will use one of my studio boards, a board like this or for a bigger piece, a board like you do is you just set this on. Let's pretend this board's longer because I don't have a longer one that doesn't have clay on it. You'll just set it on and you'll just kind of do this on the board. So, for example, here's a plate I made. It's a little smaller, but it might be easier to, to see. Once I make the plate, I'll put the board on it and I'll just kind of press doo -doo -doo, like that, pull the board off and still let this sit up and dry. So that's what I do for the foot. But that's a great question. Thank you so much for putting it out there. And I think I, this is the class that's coming out. Look at that cutie. So I think I explained that in the class that'll be out Friday. But um, if not, now you got it, right? Yeehaw. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and flip this over and remove the form. Now, honestly, I won't flip it over like I just did. What I will do is I'll have it like this and then I'll take a wear board and I'll put a wear board on top, right? And then we flip the whole thing over like that. So for bigger trays like this, you want to invest in making 
or having someone make you some boards. This one's really big. I have some smaller ones that work better. But then you can go ahead and pull off your form, right? And on a big platter like this, if you pull it off too soon, you can get the slumping in the middle. How do you go to prime time? Okay. So, Kathy, the only way I can add you to prime time, if you're a premium member, it will say on clayshare.com what you do. But send me a message on Facebook, private message me, and let me know. Um, I believe you've, Kathy, Kathy, I think you're in the prime time group. Pretty sure you are, hon. All right. But I will check into that after. Kev, will you remember for me? Mm -hmm. All right. So, what I did here is I made this. And I trimmed my edges, and I've already gone in and done it a little bit, but if you find your edges are uneven, you can use sure form tools. And you just go ahead and look at this. Pulling it along, you're basically shaving. See? You're shaving off the clay to make it even. So this is how I did the rim on this particular piece right here. So that's this piece right here. And I did a double foot on this one. I suggest when you do larger forms like this, you do a double foot of some. Of why you should. This right here, I did not do the double foot. It was plenty dry to flip it out. I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but it has a slight slumping right here. I, I know better. I know better. I should not have done that. I should have put a second foot on. I did not. So now I have a bow. So my plate tray platter will bow a little bit and there's nothing I can do about it. Isn't a problem for something I'm going to keep for myself, but it is a problem if you want to sell it. Um, and also if you're giving it away, you might, you might not want that to be happening. So I just go around the edges and I shave off. And this is a nice leather hard at this point. This was made two days ago and I've kept it covered really well with plastic. So we get this down to where we want to be and all I do is dump these in my work bucket of water. Just dump that over there. And then to finish that edge, take a damp sponge and smooth it. So let's talk more about warping. If you flip it out too soon, it'll warp. So a bunch of people were saying they, they flip it out really fast. If you flip it out while it's still too wet, what can happen is like what I have. I had that slumping, right? So that's a problem. That's a warping thing. So what if you put it back on the form and weigh it down overnight? At this point, it's too dry. This one here is way is too dry for that. So I have miss that window. This one will have a slump in it. So it's okay. I'll keep one for me and then uh, the better ones I'll, I'll have available for others. That's just how it is. It's okay. So I'm just using my sponge and if you want to, you can use that rib. It does an amazing job of smoothing. See how we're just smoothing out this rim? It does, I'm going to scoot it back a little bit so you guys can see. Fabulous job really smoothing this out. And then, is it a planer? Pat, it's basically, this is a Stanley tool. There it is, so you can see what it looks like. It's called a Sureform tool. They come in different shapes and sizes, and it's just made by Stanley. It says Sureform on it. Oh, there's a number. It's 215, I think, 399, 21399. So that's the model number for this particular one. And then they have a shorter one, which I have and I do love. And other companies make these. Um, clay companies make them too. I just get them from the hardware store just because I can walk in and get one and have it the same day, right? You have a problem with your edges warping. So meaning you're getting a wobble in your edge. That usually happens if you take it off the form too soon. So if you're having problems with your edge here getting a warp, that's because it's too soft when you take it off the form. So that's something to think. The 21399, that's the model number of it, right? 
So the next step is this has to dry all the way. And if you leave it just like this, let's think about what's happening. Well, we have the wood underneath that's pulling moisture, right, from the feet, and you have air above pulling as well. So you have two areas, but it's gonna dry more on the top. So what will happen is you'll get a bowing, and what I usually see is these sides start to curl up, or the opposite happens and the middle pulls up. And yeah, I have, let's see, where's my yellow one? You wanna grab my yellow sure form? I have a yellow one with a handle, it's fabulous. Got a, a question about your, your clear. Is your clear a satin? I do have a satin, mine's a gloss. My 2167 clear is a gloss clear, zinc free. So this is my other sure form tool right here. It's also made by, it's called sure form shaver. And this one is the, oh, there's a number, but I can't read it. Let's see if I can get it. Two, a, uh, something here. Somebody want to read that? I'll put it over here. <laughs> can you guys read this? Because I can't. So this yellow one is another one by Stanley, and it has a nice handle, and it's really good because you can do little things. I just like the big one for nice long areas. So you have a problem getting it over the form evenly, Diana. So if your clay is a nice even thickness when you're draping it, and you smooth gently, you're not trying to crush your clay. You're not trying to squash your clay and make your clay uneven. You just want to smooth it gently onto the form and it will take shape. And this one is fairly dry because I can hold it. It's, it's definitely a nice dry leather hard. And for the next step, this has to dry up and I don't want any bowing. So what I do, and I, this is how I've done it for years and it works really well for me, is I take plastic on the top, put some plastic on it. These happen to be from a big box store, plastic bags, you know. I'm gonna keep using them for, in, because I have them, so I'm gonna. And then I am just gonna fill this with weight bags. The whole thing filled, you can see, all filled up. You see how the whole thing is filled up with weight bags? So everywhere, the yellow one is 21415. Thank you, Pamela. Yay. All right. So that's this one right here, the yellow one. I don't know if I can put them in the Amazon shop, but I'll see. And if I can, I will for you guys. Um, so one edge usually shorter than the other side. Oh, so you're not getting an, you're not, when you're flipping over or draping your clay, you're not getting it lined up perfectly. So that just takes practice if that's what's happening. And I do suggest get a ruler. And when you actually sit this on your clay, measure. Measure your sides, measure your, adjust it so that it's more even. So you can use a ruler and measure and that will help get it aligned correctly. So you can get a form that, you know, is pleasing and you're happy with. How much are the weight bags? How much do they weigh? Um, they don't weigh that much. This was the arm of an old long sleeve shirt of mine that I tied a knot in one end, filled it up with kitty litter and tied a knot in the other end. These are fancy high-tech tools that I use in the studio. Um, so these are, this, this was a great shirt. I love this shirt. It was so nice and now it's in my studio. I would say, um, I would say these here are how, maybe a pound. Maybe they weigh about a pound. And so you just fill it all up so that the entire bottom is full. But you've got to make sure your platter has dried enough to support the weight or else it will collapse. Could you put another ring on it? Pat, I cannot now on this one. On my other one I can, but this one I can't. This one's too dry. We've gone too far. I got a question for you from YouTube. So, okay. Uh, this person uh, did a rectangular open box. It was bisque and everything was fine. Then when she glazed it and it came out of the kiln, it was very warped. And she's wondering what was it a flat bottomed piece? So uh, often, um, so it was a box. So what tends to happen if it's a large area, you need to put something under it. I use alumina hydrate under and that helps it move. Also, it, it, you have to have a shelf that's completely flat. So that actually leads me into the next part. So. After this is completely bone dry, I will leave it like this till it's 100% dry. I will not take the weight bags off until it's completely 
done. So you did this with no foot. You weighed it down pat with no foot and it bowed in the middle. You put more weight on it. If it's bowing, it doesn't have enough weight. You need to, if it has no foot on it, you can put the weight on sooner than if it doesn't. So just think, think that, um, think about that when you're making it and put more weight on it. That will happen. They do bow and they're, they're trying to dry and pull up, right? So I figured out you could put me on the big TV. Oh, Sherry, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the next step, which after you've dried it and say it hasn't warped, you're going to fire it. And that will help me address um, the person's comment. So when you're firing it for your bisque fire, I know people say you can fire them on the edge. I, I have done it. I have seen it warp. Do not do that. If you want to make sure your piece doesn't warp, don't fire your trays on the edge ever at all. It's just bad. It really, really is. So fire them flat and make sure the shelf you're firing on is one complete shelf. Don't ever have it spanning across where two shelves come together. You know, in your kiln, oftentimes we have these half shelves. So let's pretend these are half shelves and you have that gap right here. If you are putting your pieces across that gap, you're gonna have problems with warping. It's not, even if they're level to each other, it will still warp. And also check your shelf. If your shelf isn't nice and flat, what's gonna happen is your tray, plate, platter, whatever you're making is gonna actually conform to that shelf. So it will get a warp from the shelf. So that's a problem as well. And, and the next thing you have is the glaze fire. So a lot can happen in glaze firing and in bisque firing, it's not so much of an issue for movement, uh, but in glaze firing it can be. So if you're doing a really large piece, you might need some alumina hydrate under, under it, which will allow it to adjust and move. Also, uh, going back to the bisque firing, don't stack them in each other. That can cause breaking too, because the weight of the big one, you know, it's trying to move and then it has a weight of a smaller one on it and as these two are trying to move, what can happen is the bigger one can crack because the smaller one's holding it in place too much and it can't move because clay, clay does expand, right? And contract during the firing. I know, you're like, what? It expands? It does. It's the different silica particles. It totally happens. It's a chemical reaction. You should look it up. It's fabulous. So someone asks, what? Thickness did I start with? This was about three eighths of an inch, but it's a quarter inch by the time I actually make a pot with it after I smooth it down and drape it over. So you could put grog, exactly. So alumina hydrate's what I use because that's what I have. You can put grog on the shelf. Just be aware that sometimes the grog can stick into the clay and you can have grog stuck on your foot and you'll have to grind it down. It's just a little thing. Plus the grog, can actually be moved and pulled up during firing if you're using a vent. The air current can move that grog and it can actually stick in places you don't want it. So you might find bits of grog inside a mug or a platter. I've had that happen. That's never good, right? Plate rack stilts. So I, okay. All right, for bisque firing, you can use them. I know people who do and have great success. I have tried them, they warped my plates, so I don't use them. But the thing is, just with like everything, give it a try, see if it works for you, and if it does, fantastic. If it doesn't, try something else. Everything is trial and error, and what works for me, you might be struggling and it's not working for you, so you might have to get creative and come up with a different idea, right? You have a bisque firing now and you stacked your trays. Well, Kathleen, it might be okay, it might be okay. I know people who do uh, tumble stacking and they stack their trays and everything and, and it's great, but I don't do it. Now, another thing with warping, a lot of people think my pieces are too thick. They think that rolling out a 3 8 inch slab or a quarter inch slab is way too thick. But I have to tell you, if you make it too thin, it's going to warp. Thin clay warps more than thick clay. Not that thick clay won't warp, but thin clay will. So. I want to show you how I dry my plates. So this plate right here was one I just made. And this one, let me scoot this back. To dry these, uh, I just put a couple weight bags. Usually I'll have one that's big enough that will cover the entire bottom. So this is what you're seeing. 
Do you see how the weight bag is covering all flat surfaces? So it's keeping my foot, you want the foot firmly on the board. That's what we're trying to keep down. Not so much worried about the sides. Now, if you're having a hard time with one side warping funnily and not the other, so if one side's like curling up more than the other, what could be happening to you is when it's drying, you see how I have the plastic? I'm gonna actually tuck this plastic around as this dries. So if, as it's drying, the plastic pulls up over here like this, and I don't realize it, and this dries much, much faster than this over here, we can have a warp where the drier clay meets the wet clay because the dry clay is drying and pulling and shrinking at a different rate than the wet clay. So that can cause the warping. So uneven dryness is also a problem. So you wanna make sure you dry evenly. So keep it covered with plastic, or if you have a damp box or a damp cabinet, use that. Another question from YouTube? Uh, your gloss glaze yes. is dipping only, or is it, uh -huh. or can you brush it as well? You c it's a dipping glaze, but you can brush it on. But only one coat, and it doesn't brush on super smooth because it is a dipping glaze. Just get a brush really full of it and do a sweep motion across, dip it in the glaze again and do it again. And I like to use a really wide brush for that and you just dip and brush. But yeah, you can brush on my glaze if you want to, but it is a dip and pour. Now you can add some stuff to it and we, we can talk about that um, if you want. So you can add to it um, a little bit of sodium silicate and it should be good Oh, if you put a little bit of that in it. So there's a ratio I'll get to you all. How's that? I'll find out. Drew's not here. He's like my ratio glaze guy. So I could tell you. All right. But yeah, you can use it to brush on. These here are brush on glazes. This is sea foam from Georgie's. That's this glaze. And then this one is also Georgie's, but it's not just a glaze. It's their Indigo Interactive Pigment. And on top is their Super Clear, which does have zinc in it. So... All right, so these plates will dry until they're completely bone dry, like they are now. This one's completely bone dry, and let's just check it. No wobble, no wobble at all. So you can tell if you have a wobble, your plate will be like, like this. Your plate will do this, wobble, wobble, wobble. What happens if you have a wobble? Is it the end of the world? Do we throw the plate away at this point when it's dry like this? No, no we don't, don't do that. It'll be okay, I promise. How will it be okay? Well. I'm gonna show you how it'll be okay. This is how it'll be okay. So what you can do is you can take your plate and if it has a wobble in it, on your board, when it's about leather hard or a little drier, just do this. And yeah, if you're gonna do this though, you wanna wear your mask. I run my air filter. Those are things that, that are issues. But you're basically smoothing the bottom. You're kind of sanding it down. Now, what I think's a better option is if you get the board wet, and you do it on a wet board because a wet board will still, you can't see it, but there's a fine layer of clay there. And, and now I've not created any clay dust, but I've smoothed it down. The other thing you can do is do this. And if it's a really high spot, you can come in with one of these and you can shave off the high area. And you'll see it because that'll be the area that's flattened the most. Right? So you can see the wet bottom that I have here. So what is the difference between zinc-free and not zinc-free glaze and why would you want them? So zinc is a material used in glazes and it's a great material, but zinc sometimes reacts with certain things. So zinc will react to underglaze and to mason stains and some pigments and oxides differently. So if you want to use a, um, let me show you an example. Hold on, let me get you two things. So I have over here uh, two, they're so close though. All right, so I have two examples of glaze on the indigo pigment. So this right here is the indigo pigment with zinc free clear. That's the first one. And here we have indigo pigment with zinc in it. So this is super clear, has zinc in it. They're very close. The zinc-free clear is lighter. The indigo one with the glaze with zinc is deeper and darker. So it's reacted. It's melted the pigment, 
um, on this one a little more. So what happens is zinc, basically some people say eat away at your underglaze or zinc will eat away at your pigment and it doesn't remove it all the way but it definitely helps it melt more and sometimes it will pull it off and you'll get running and you'll, you'll see that on underglaze decals sometimes and they'll have a running to them. So zinc can cause it to flux, exactly, the run. So um, is there anything wrong with zinc versus not having zinc? No, some of my favorite glazes have zinc in it. It just depends what you want for an effect. Uh, I do think some glazes are better with zinc and some glazes are, are better without, right? So it's just knowing what you want to achieve as your end result and picking the correct glaze. Now for an underglaze transfer, if I'm having that on a piece of pottery, I'm going to use a zinc free glaze unless I want it to run, then I'll use a zinc glaze. So just something, something to think about. My slab thickness again, sure. So it's, it was 3 8 of an inch when I first rolled it out. So let me pull this off and we can look at this one here. So this was 3 8 of an inch when I first rolled it out. But after I compress it with the yellow rib, like I did, and then I rolled my texture into it, it has made it a, a little smaller, right? So it's down to a quarter of an inch. And I do find that a quarter of an inch is a nice thickness if you want to make plates that are going to last, plates that you can use and not worry about the edges chipping or getting broken. You know, when you have pottery that has very fine, thin edges, they often chip and you want sturdy pottery. You know, you want things that are going to last. I mean, look at this one. This is beautiful. This is a very elegant, beautiful plate. And it's made from a slab of clay that was 3 8 of an inch, but then smoothed down to a quarter of an inch. And it will shrink even more in the firing. And it'll, it'll be perfect. It'll be the absolute perfect weight. So, so I think 3 8 of an inch is a good thickness. You could go to a quarter of an inch and start there, but you know. So what do I mean by running, melting, Kathleen? They melt and, and run down the pot. Yes, they will. Uh, on the transfers. The transfers will melt and run. Let me show you. Hold on. I've got a piece over here, and we can talk about it. I've got two pieces. Let me just show you. Hold on. I'm coming back. Okay. I don't know how well this will show because it's a colored glaze with zinc. So here we have an underglaze decal right here with a zinc-free clear on top. So we have a nice clear image. We don't have any running, smearing, or anything like that. Now, I used the zinc-free clear for the bottom, but on the top, I used my Chun Blue, which has zinc in it. And I don't know if you can see how the blue, the dark blue has been pulled out. Do you see how some of the dark blue is starting to melt and run? The zinc does that. It actually grabs the color and starts to pull it down, melt it down. So that's what happens when you use a zinc glaze. It doesn't ruin anything. I did this on purpose because I knew it would run and I knew it would pull on that glaze and it would look yummy. Like that's what I wanted. It's very pretty. But um, so the bottom is a clear that doesn't have zinc. The top is my Chun Blue, which has zinc. A question about my wear boards. These are three quarter inch birch plywood right here. So it's a birch plywood that has had two coats of water-based polyurethane applied to both sides. And you have to reapply the polyurethane every six months. If you use them a lot, maybe every four months. And you want to sand lightly between each coat of the water-based polyurethane. And you use the water-based because it is less, um, well, it's more porous. We'll just go with that and so that your clay doesn't stick as much. What do I do with my test tiles with the cookie cutters don't warp? What do I do? So the little pieces, oh, my little ones. Um, well, I think in my class when I make them, I show you, but I press them down on a board and I press it into the board and then I remove the stamp part and I let it stay. I don't actually move the little test tile. I leave it sitting on the board and it's a small thing. It's really been pressed onto the board and it will just dry on its own, it will dry fine. Same thing with uh, tea bag holders and spoon rests. I don't weigh those down at all. Little pieces, little tiny things, you can just press them onto your boards and don't move them. Let them stay until they're completely, completely dry. Chun Blue does make the underglaze blur. Yes, it does. It does, because that's the zinc in it, Lorelei. Yeah, the zinc does it.
and it's gorgeous, but I don't use it on the entire thing because if I dip the whole thing in the light blue, I would have that smear. All right, so we're, that's it. We're wrapping up. So there's a lot to talk about with warping and I know we could go on for another hour, but um, that, that's it, that's it. We're done for, for today's live. Now, those of you who are my premium members and you know who you are, we're gonna be doing prime time in just a minute. I gotta gather a couple things. We're gonna, we're gonna be making, um, I think we're gonna make an Easter egg truck. You might be thinking, what? That's right, so I have a class on making a pumpkin truck and a Christmas tree truck. We are gonna do an Easter egg version of that truck that you can use as a wall decoration. So next week I'll be back for another live broadcast. Ah, uh, what do I have? Um, luster. It says I'll be doing luster. I don't know if I'll be doing that on the broadcast. We'll see. Maybe. It depends what's going on. All right. Add a dictionary to the website and people could just search for what they want info on. Christine, we had one when we started. We had a glossary of terms for ClayShare. I spent days writing it all out. Um, it just was a big, big document and it weighed everything down and slowed the site down. So we took it off. But, you know, maybe a glossary of terms would be helpful and maybe we'll have to put one back up there. The heart on the wall, oh, yes. Yeah, this was that class that I modified and I put the little, the little heart version, I put an air plant in it. Isn't that the cu cutest, cutest, so cute. And Tangelo Celadon from Amico with my pin flower rolling pin right here. All right, so if you're new to Prime, once you get invited to the group, you just go to Clay Share Prime. It'll show up as your groups. If you're not there yet, I'm sorry. I get a ton of messages I have to go through every day and add people. It takes a while to get everybody in there. I work as much as I can to get you all in. I will go through after the broadcast and add a bunch more people. But if you um, are in there this week, when you do get in, you can watch the replay and then you'll know what's going on for next week. All right, everyone. Catch you, lady.